All right, welcome back. And this is our last presentation for the day, DME and assisted technology, which is a huge um, plethora of information that we're going to hear. And it's always been one of great concern of a lot of our um, DMD and BMD fellows. So Timothy Estelo is a OTRL and an occupational therapist at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. In his current role as a clinical specialist, he represents CHOP on several international allied healthcare consortiums, inherited neuropathy consortium, and international spinal muscular atrophy consortium, as well as serving on the advisory board of the Charcot Marie Tooth Association. And then after his presentation, we will hear from Terry Carey, who is a physical therapist at Children's Hospital, Colorado. She graduated from the University of Colorado Physical Therapy Program and has worked as a pediatric physical therapist for her entire career at Children's Hospital Colorado. She has been the therapist at the Multidisciplinary Neuromuscular Clinic for more than 30 years. And additionally, she's involved as the clinical evaluator in numerous clinical trials for neuromuscular patients, including Duchenne, SMA, and other neurological disorders. So Tim, I will turn it over to you and you could start sharing. That's good. Okay. Can you see? Okay. Yep, you're good. All righty. So thank you. I'm happy to speak today at this MDA meeting. I always look forward to these meetings to see the familiar faces in person and also to meet, meet new faces and new friends. So unfortunately, we won't be able to do that today, but I look forward to having the opportunity to share some content that I hope you find useful. Um, so I have no financial disclosures for today, but that doesn't mean I don't have tons of support. And I'd like to especially acknowledge my two daughters, Olivia and Ryland are always very supportive of me doing this work, giving me extra time on weekends and late at night, understanding why I can't always play. So I wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, I wanna to cover today's talk kind of going from through the lifespan for a child with DMD and starting in the early ambulatory phase and then moving through to the non-ambulatory phase. The interventions that we'll speak about and some of the devices that we'll speak about using aren't necessarily only used in that particular phase, but may be used across the lifespan. However, I'm gonna to try to introduce them uh, in the phase that we initially start with them. So early ambulatory phase where kids have a little bit of weakness, still getting around fairly good, um, but may need some minor modifications. And then as we move closer to the preteen, early teen years, well, preteen years, we get in this late ambulatory phase where there's a little bit more weakness more fatigue, contractures may start to develop, uh, may need a scooter or a manual wheelchair from time to time, we'll touch on that phase. And then finally, the non-ambulatory phase where our boys are using uh, power mobility, have more upper limb limitations, and then also require uh, more assistance from families, caregivers, or, for, excuse me, or from technology. So the goal today is to identify some things in each one of these phases that will be helpful for your children. Uh, Briefly, I want to touch on some quick functional assessments. When you go to the care centers, it's important your physical therapist and occupational therapist there will do different measures and to see how your child is functioning. And these measures, specifically the pull, the performance of the upper limb, is an assessment that allows us to look and see how your child is doing with their arm for functional tasks. And this allows us to screen for some limitations, screen for some possible errors we might want to intervene, and gives us a good way to follow them over time. Uh, in addition to this, recently, we started doing TMJ range of motion assessments. We found that some of our older neuromuscular patients and some of our older boys with Duchenne are having difficulty with uh, opening of the jaw, and this can make uh, chewing, swallowing, eating problematic. So uh, we now take range of motion assessments to look at jaw opening, and we'll touch on a possibility for that. Uh, so the first phase is really this, this early inventory phase. And, and the goal here is to keep our boys as active as possible. They have good range of motion, right? They have a little bit of proximal weakness, but still pretty good strength. And we want to keep these joints pliable. We want to keep activating these muscles and using their bodies. This can be, you know, sports, t-ball, baseball, soccer, 
Uh, martial arts is a great, great activity. There's lots of stretching involved. It's, a, it's more of an individual paced uh, sport. So the child can still continue for, for a long time without having to worry about necessarily keeping up with the peers. Uh, swimming is a great one, cycling, coloring, drawing. So, you know, the main goal here is community activity, good habits, good hobbies at home, keeping our kids engaged and active and using their bodies. Stretching will initiate depending on your child's uh, needs during this point. And when you go to your care center and you see your therapist, as part of their assessment, they're going to look at your child's range of motion. So they'll look actively how much they can reach on their own. It may also look passively if your child's limited in how much they can move on their own to see how much they can stretch or move a joint and uh, they'll identify specific areas for intervention so generally the, the two spots during this early phase where you may see some tightness are the the muscles on the underside of the forearm that close the fingers and then in the lower extremity the heel cords and the ankles so these are two common areas where your therapist will often give you stretches that you can do. And, and the goal of the stretch is really to maintain this muscle length and, and prevent a continual decrease in muscle length and, and tightness that could result in a muscle contracture, which is a limitation in the movement of the joint that can then impede, impede function. Uh, there may be a need to make some basic environmental changes. So, you know, squatting down to retrieve items from the floor or from low cabinets are challenging for some of our boys, as is reaching up to re retrieve things from overhead cabinets that are heavy. So you, you may look around the house and rearrange the toys or objects in the kitchen or where their clothes hang in the bedroom to get things more kind of between like me, knee to shoulder level, so they don't have to reach too far overhead for heavier things, or again, squat down too low for the things that are hard to retrieve. Next, as, as our boys age and they're in that late ambulatory phase and the upper extremity, it's very common that those finger flexors we spoke about earlier begin to tighten. This is a good, this is a good spot to start some nighttime splitting. Uh, I have a few pictures up of different types of splints that exist. There's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. It's based on what your child needs, what, what fits their comfort level, and, and how you kind of work it into the routine. These are splints that you want to wear at night while the child sleeps. So they get a nice prolonged stretch to the muscles, but we want the hands free during the day. We want the hands free, active during the day so they can move, manipulate objects, and assist with, with daily skills. Uh, the elbow, some of our older boys will get some, some stiffness in the elbow that will limit their ability for them to extend, extend the arm fully. So there's also some splints that look at giving a good stretch to, to that elbow. So, uh, so daytime stretching would be implemented, and then if, if necessary, uh, nighttime splint to help maintain this range of motion. As, as movement gets a little more challenging and some of this tightness starts to creep up, it can make daily activities, specifically dressing, a little more challenging. So there's some great options out there. I have a patient family who created this foundation called Runway of Dreams. Uh, she works in the fashion industry and advocates for kids with various types of disabilities in adaptive clothing. Cat and Jack has a line, Tommy Adaptive as well. These are just a few. Um, they have pants that have stretchy, expandable, uh, they're stretchy and expandable at the ankle and the distal foot to kind of get around braces, Velcro, uh, Velcro clothings and fasteners so the kids don't have to worry about manipulation. And, and basically stuff that's fashionable and looks like all the other clothing that's out there, but is more accessible for our kids that have some work limitations to kind of get on and get off. Sneakers, this is a big one. A lot of our kids wear feet splints and they have a hard time sometimes finding the proper shoe or a shoe that's easy to get the foot in and out of, especially easy enough for them to get their foot with the brace on in and out of them by themselves. So a good way to kind of increase their independence and let them maintain that is there some adapted shoes out there. Nike has the Flyies, which is a basketball sneakers, and it has a zipper that starts on the medial side, the inside of the ankle, and wraps all the way around to the other side, and the entire rear of the shoe, with the exception of this little kind of heel cup at the bottom, removes. So the child can then slide the foot in to the shoe and then wrap it around. Uh, Billy Footwear is another company that makes some great some great fashionable footwear for kids. They have a little bit of a different approach. 
as you can see, their zippers run along the front and open up the entire top of the shoe that pulls out. And then the child would put the shoe, would put the foot in down through the top of the shoe and zipper it back up. So these are just a few, few of the many options that are out there in terms of footwear. As, as those hands get a little bit tighter and kids lose some of the dexterity in their fingers or they have some proximal weakness, it may be, become difficult to bring the arms to midline and to do their buttons and do their zippers and fasteners and things like that. There's different types of adaptive clothing like myself belts, which is a one-handed one -handed technique that uses a Velcro fastener just to peel off and peel on. And it still has the outward facing appearance of, of your standard belt. So there's no sign by looking at it that it's anything different than what their friends would be wearing. Uh, the magnet zip is another helpful thing. You can buy, this is uh, Under Armour makes jackets that already have this uh, as part of the jacket, or you can buy the zipper itself for uh, like 10 or $15 and have it put on to your child's clothing. It's a magnetic zipper that all you have to do is, is get both sides close enough to each other where it'll magnetize and latch, and then you can, just, you can just pull it up. So it really doesn't require a lot of distal manipulation with the fingers or a lot of proximal movement if those are challenging, challenging tasks for the boys. As our kids transition into the non-ambulatory phase and upper extremity motion becomes more limited and it gets harder to reach away from the body, or it gets harder to bring the hand uh, up to the face for facial grooming or for self-feeding and to maintain that hand in space, there's different options that can help, that can help with feeding and grooming. So easy hold is just one example of many that are out there of universal cuffs that can attach to various daily objects and reinforce your child's grasp. So if they have a weak grasp or if they fatigue with grasp or if they have a hard time maintaining the grasp, this is just simply a little rubber cuff that would go over the back of the hand, allow them to hold on. Electric toothbrush is always a great one, right? Does all the work, even for the little guys. They don't do a good job cleaning. It's a good way to get started. Uh, lots of my patients have these wonderful water bottles with the flexible, flexible tubing here. Hydration is extremely, extremely important for our boys with, with DMD. If you talk with your nutritionist, your dietitian, when you go in the clinic, I'm sure they're always asking you about it. We have uh, a, a lot of patients who don't get enough fluids during the day. This is essential for their skin, for their muscles, for their function. This is a way that you can mount this to the wheelchair and position it so that if they're not able to lift the bottle up uh, themselves to drink, they can turn the head or reach the straw and get the fluids that they need. There's some great feeders out there for, uh, for our kids who have lost the ability to bring the hand to the mouth um, and want to remain independent with feeding. This is a model, they, they operate on remote switches that you can put uh, anywhere under the finger, next to the knee, uh, on the side of the head, however you want to do it. And it's just a small little click and it scoops. It can choose between different options of what food you want. It's easy to program and it can bring, bring the food to the mouth. So again, just some ways to maintain independence if our kids want to continue to do these things on their own without the assistance of nurses, parents, caregivers, et cetera. Uh, another great thing that I'm really passionate about and I try to work with a lot of my patients with are mobile arm supports. So the, the other difficulty with this weakness in the shoulder and the weakness in the elbow, not only does it limit you know, active movement and impair function, but it also makes it challenging for our kids to find a way to exercise, right? They still have strength in these muscles. Even though the muscles may be weak, they still have strength where they can use these muscles and we wanna give them opportunities to move and the benefit of exercise. So there's many types of mobile arm supports out there. Some are, uh, are passively powered, like the one up top here, the Rex, which uses rubber bands. And basically the rubber bands unweight the arm to take the weight and the resistance to the arm away and allow the arm to move freely in space. There are also other units that are motorized and a little more high tech that have actuators and motors that accentuate the movement as the child moves. Uh, and again, these are great options for improving function in ADLs and allowing exercise. So I have a couple quick videos just, just to show you. Here's a boy roughly 12 years old with Duchenne. Probably looks very familiar in terms of the movement style a lot of you. If the elbow's positioned appropriately and he has good support, he can easily bend, he can easily bend that arm up. He can flex his trunk and flex his neck forward to, to help bring it towards his hand for feeding himself. 
but he's got a lot of difficulty with trying to get that arm to reach out in space. And, and the problem we have, a lot of our boys end up getting spinal fixation, and then you lose, you lose the ability to bend that trunk and to bend that head forward for self-feeding. So see, he relies a lot on those compensatory trunk techniques. So with a mobile arm support, we can unweight the arm, and you can see now he's able to elevate the arm up off the armrest. He can hold his arm in space and, and he can move freely. So he could do this for play. He could use, you know, play his Nintendo Wii. He could, you know, do active exercise. And you could say, I ask him to pretend like he's eating something. He, you know, he doesn't have to use those trunk and postural and head compensations to get that hand up to his mouth for feeding. So it's an excellent device. Uh, here's another child, a little bit older, on 17 or 18, just to give you another clinical picture. You know, has the distal hand skills for grasp. Again, the elbow's propped, so he can bend the arm a little bit, but Roy doesn't have the ability to bring the hand up to his mouth. And when we put him in and we unweight the arm, and it, this is a boy who hasn't fed himself in years, you can see he picks up the pretzel and he gets so excited, he gets a nice big smile and he's able to feed himself, feed himself the pretzel. So it takes some time, he has to get used, to, you know, you'll see he has to get used to kind of coordinating his strength with the device, but it really gives him an opportunity now to, to do something to feed himself and to regain independence that, that he's lost. And then also again, to move freely. So we had him using his cell phone, uh, using his tablet where he could keep the tablet vertically and look at it and not have to hyperflex his neck all the way down because it had to be close to his body. So his father commented like, oh, I can understand you when you speak to me when you're on your tablet because your chin's not all the way, bur all the way buried in your chest. Um, we mentioned earlier that TMJ limitations. So if, if your child is starting to have some tightness and limitations in how wide they can open their mouth, you want to work with your therapist on some stretches that can be done, but there's also a device called the Therabyte that provides a stretch to those muscles in the jaw that get tight and limit range of motion. Uh, technology. So this is great. This is perhaps you know the best thing for for our patients is the the advent of technology and and the accessibility now for you know twenty to thirty dollars we can get you know low tech things like Amazon Echo uh, that can play music, turn on the TV. Uh, these things are very accessible now. Years ago, you had to use complex environmental control units and switches and things that were in the thousands of dollars. Now, there's, there, I mean, every company has these devices, including you know, your cable company probably. And you can control everything from ceiling fans, door locks, blinds, the temperature in the room. And, and most importantly for our guys, you know, the TV, to get the TV on, to get the Xbox set up and play their video games. So. There's tons of options for environmental control and again, helping to maintain as much independence in the household as possible and empowering, empowering our kids to participate in their daily activities. Video games, we all love our Xbox and PS4 and I'm sure now during the COVID era when everybody's quarantined, your kids are logging lots of, lots of hours on the gaming systems. These are two, uh, two adaptations. Microsoft Xbox has a module that you can buy that you plug your controller into, and then you can use all sorts of switches and, and variations to control the Xbox and still play the games. Uh, a controller I particularly like, which is made for you know, these quote unquote professional gamers, but is great, great for our kids with weakness or limitations in mobility, is this scuff gaming controller. What it does is it has on each side here, if you can see my cursor, it has little paddles that they can, they can touch that are very light to use and easy to move. But on the bottom side, there's four other buttons. And what you can do is you can replace any of the four buttons on here on the, on the face of the controller or any of these top, the two top, you know, I think they're the R buttons is what they're called. Um, you can replace their functionality with the buttons down low. And this works good because some of our kids lose the mobility in those thumbs and those fingers that come up and around the controller, but while the hands are underneath, they can still interact with it. Finally, the last thing I want to, want to touch on, which is very important in all phases, and I think all of our boys should have an opportunity for this, is, is, is aquatic therapy. This could be formal aquatic therapy with a therapist, which would be you know, the ideal thing, but it could be hard to come by. But even with the parents in the YMCA, 
uh, or if you have to travel to a clinic to do a few sessions with a therapist to learn how to work with your child in the pool and then you carry out closer to home, that's good as well. The, the water affords them the most independence they're gonna have. The buoyancy of the water really makes it easy for the kids to stay in and to move. It eliminates a lot of the stress on the joints, reduces the weight bearing. It's highly effective for rehabilitation purposes. So we've had a lot of boys fall and have fractures, femur fractures after Duchenne and with Duchenne after a fall. And they're very hesitant to get back and start walking again. But if you get them in the water where they know they're safe, and you can use that viscosity of the water, which decreases the speed of your movement, gives you a little bit more reaction time, and, and again, unweights the limbs. You can get kids up and walking again and moving again. Uh, you can also use the water itself for the turbulence based on how you move the child to assist with movement. So it, it's, it's, a great, it's a great spot for exercise for our kids. Uh, the Hallowick method is a method that was developed um, specifically to teach children with different types of disabilities how to swim. So it teaches them how to move, how to manipulate their body so they can get in the pool and safely swim. It's one of the methods that our therapists use uh, and it's very effective. I want to share a quick video. We were, uh, through the therapists I worked with, we're lucky they applied for a grant and they got funding through the Christopher and Dana Reeves Foundation and they ran an adaptive swim group for boys with Duchenne. And it was just a great, a great way of getting our kids together, having some camaraderie. You know, they're able to build their confidence. The parents are able to learn how, how to uh, transfer the kids into the pool, how to move them within a pool and get them, get them in a good environment. Oh, sorry. And you can see here, I'll play and I'll leave the audio on. So you can, this is one of our guys, you know, who would learn, hold on his back, and use his feet and use his arms to propel himself through the water. And it's, it's just the same thing because now he has now he has a recognition that he can do in the community with his friends and with his family that, that he didn't have before, while at the same time giving him a great opportunity to move his legs, move his arms, feel nice and loose and 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 function in the water. So there were just a few things I wanted to present. I know Terry has lots of great information. On, on other mobility devices and other durable medical equipment, and then we can take questions at the end after her talk. So thank you for your time. Thank you, I, oh, I guess I can unroot, sorry. We can uh, start talking about my talk. Oh, we skipped back. Um, I, I just will mention quickly, I have no disclosures, and the, there'll be a lot of products that are shown here. I don't have any endorsement of any of those products. So please know that the, sometimes it was just whatever picture was most convenient to put in the slide, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that particular wheelchair or whatever I'm showing was what we needed. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a quick uh, picture I wanted to show you. This is our neuromuscular team. Um, listening to Dr. Wong's talk this morning, she talked about multidisciplinary versus interdisciplinary. We clearly have an interdisciplinary team. This is, this is what it looks like these days for team meetings. I'm sure you're all aware of this. This is a Zoom meeting. This is what we do uh, in the COVID era. And um, this was a quick um, meeting we had and we did a screenshot of this that we used to um, celebrate all of our graduating seniors. And we used the screenshot to make a card. So uh, that was, and, but that's our team. It includes neuropsych, genetics, pulmonary, rehab, um, endocrinology, social work and neurology that are in that slide. And of course, PT. Next slide, please. So today I wanted to talk briefly about, we have a short time and there's a lot of equipment available, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what mobility options are available, talk about standards because that's one of part of the standards of care, bathroom equipment and lift and lift systems. Next slide. So mobility options, next slide. So um, when you're talking about needing to use some type of mobility option, there's lots of different things that you need to consider. So you need to say, what do you need it for? Are you use, do you need to use this just for long distances? Do you need it to get around your house? Do you need it to go to the park? Do you need it for school or do you need it for work? What, what options um, are you needing to use it for? And where are you going to use it? This, similar kinds of things. Are you going to just only use it in your house? Or would you like to be able to use it at school as well or, in, or at work? And then um, to tag onto that, how are you going to get it there? You know, that's a huge, when we're talking about these big mobility equipment, power chairs, how do you get it there? 
And, and what are the consequences if you don't get it? If you stop walking and you don't have any kind of mobility device, the consequences that you might just be sitting on the couch all day or in bed, um, those aren't great options. So those, when we're trying to justify why you need particular equipment, it's really important that, you under, that we help support why, why, what will happen if you don't get it. And again, we talked already about how are you going to transport it? Is it going to be public transportation? Is it going to be the school bus? Is it going to be in your own van with an um, accessible lift? Or are you just going to use it in your house and then take it down to the park if you want to go play? And really important, hard to minimize this one, who's going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for it? Um, insurance um, justification varies a lot from state to state. It varies a lot from what insurance companies are willing to pay. And you need to have help with this. Um, and so who can help, how do you get this stuff? So in our clinic, we're lucky enough to actually have um, DME durable medical equipment providers in our clinic um, that help do an evaluation with, in our clinic, it's physical therapy. We aren't lucky enough to have a TIM in our clinic, so we don't have occupational therapy. So it's usually uh, the physical therapists that do this. So we decide to, tr we try to figure out what's gonna work for them. And that needs to be done in our state and Medicaid requires that a face-to-face evaluation with a um, assistive technology professional from a durable medical equipment company and a physical therapist and a physician be involved in that. Next slide, please. So we're gonna start out talking just about low tech options and then we'll move into more high tech options. So there's three different things that I think of that are fairly commonly used for low tech. So an adaptive stroller, low tech mobility, adaptive stroller, manual wheelchair and transport chair. The ad adaptive stroller, is, is this is nice, you can fold it up, you can throw it in and out of the car, it works really well, but there are a lot of other disadvantages as well. Um, it's a very dependent piece of equipment. You don't, you, you have no ability to push it. Um, it also looks like something that young children might use. For children with severe cognitive and, aut and autistic tendencies, this might be your very best option for long term. They don't have the cognitive abilities to use a higher um, higher tech mobility device, this works great. One um, disadvantage is strollers might not be covered by insurance. If you call it a stroller, it might not be covered. You might have to call it a manual wheelchair. Manual wheelchairs are always important. I think it's great to have a manual wheelchair, even if you have a power chair, if you're lucky enough to have an insurance company that's willing to pay for both. I always recommend this because power always has the tendency to go down and you need something as a backup. These are also very lightweight. They're, they have more ad options for adaptive seating than um, a stroller does. And it might provide a little bit of ability for self-propulsion around the house for a short term. The problem is that as you, the um, boys get older and have less strength, they can't really, they can't um, power their manual chairs enough to be able to keep up with their friends. And that's really important. If um, funding doesn't allow you to have both a manual and a power chair, I think it's really important um, that you prioritize what's more important. And that might mean that you need to have a um, power chair because that's the more expensive option. You might be able to pay for a, a manual chair, but not a power chair. Transport chairs, I have a lot of families that actually buy these on their own online. This is really lightweight chair, has absolutely no ability for any kind of adaptive seating and no ability for growth, um, but it is lightweight, it can be folded, but uh, you, there's no, you can see there's no wheels on it to be able to self-propel. Next slide, please. So there's some lighter weight power options. So um, three most commonly used um, lightweight power options are a power scooter, power assist wheels, and folding power chairs. So all of these are readily available. And again, insurance may or may not pay for all of these. Power scooter, the young guys really like these because it's, it's more socially acceptable sometimes than a power chair. They're really easy to drive. They can be broken down for transport, but I have to say that some families, some, they're not, it's not really lightweight. It can be, it can be done and most families can do it, but they're not, it's not like throwing the stroller in the car. They don't offer a lot of ability um, for a supportive seat in, and they can be really challenging for really young kids because they, they don't come in really small sizes. Power assist wheels are also a nice addition. This you can see in this picture that there is a, just a little um, motor that can be attached to a manual chair. And then with all, there's different options for it. Sometimes it's just in the wheels. Sometimes it's a special watch that you tap um, and that allows it to go. Um, a couple of cautions about this is that 
Um, I have some boys that don't have enough strength to actually stop it, and that's really important. It just gives you a little extra boost. You still have to be, you have to do some self-wheeling, but if you don't have enough um, strength to be able to stop it, it's really dangerous. It also is lightweight enough that it can tip easily, and I sadly have had one young man that did uh, tip over and get a concussion. So be careful if you're going to get that. Make sure that uh, you're safe. Folding power chairs, I see these every weekend in the Sunday papers. Uh, these are easily available. They're not very expensive, um, but they don't allow any options for being able to do any kind of seating. And insurance doesn't usually pay for these, but it's a nice, some families will elect to buy these for travel and have an, an, a backup for their regular power chair. Next slide. So we're, power chairs, is the, I'm certainly a huge advocate of power chairs. Um, I think it's, it's a huge um, mobility enhancement for all of our guys. Uh, funding can be challenging, but I'm, we're going to talk a little bit just about, I'm not going to show a lot of different types because there's lots on the market, but the, some of the common considerations you need to think about are what type of drive do you want? Do you want a front, just like buying a car, do you want front wheel, mid wheel, or rear wheel drive? And it depends on what kind of terrain you're driving in, how much of a turning radius you need, I really recommend that you work with an assistive technology professional and a therapist to try each of these and see what works best for you. And then what type of operational system do you want? Are you, most commonly we use joysticks, but do you want just a standard joystick? Do you need to have a custom adapted joystick? And for our weaker young men, mini, a mini, micro mini joystick can be really helpful uh, for boys that have lost the ability to drive with a regular joystick. And then seating is really, really important. We want to try to minimize the amount of um, um, continued like scoliosis you can get from not having proper seating. So we try to make it the most supportive seating you can. And do you want to have a linear seating system? Do you want a custom like a molded seat? Or do you want some kind of hybrid that's a combination of both? Next slide, please. So these are, I wanted to show these custom additions mostly because even though these, we, I, I order these on almost every chair, but they're not something that's to, traditionally covered. I have to write a letter of medical necessity for each of these, but they can really enhance quality of life. The power tilt and power recline can really help for um, adjusting posture, um, helping with skin um, breakdown. And the, a power tilt is where the seat to back, back angle stays st um, stable and it just tilts back. Um, I, I try to get a power recline at the same time, which actually flattens the whole seat. This is, allows for easier transfers, and it also allows for use of something like a handheld urinal, which can be really helpful. Seat elevators, I'm a huge proponent of. They get denied every time on the first try when I, when I um, write medical letters of medical necessity, but it allows you to reach into cupboards. It allows you to get into closets. It allows you to push elevator buttons, street crossing. It might allow you to look through a window um, of your door to see who's there. It allows you to be able to be at high science tables at school, at a podium if you're gonna give a talk. Um, they're really, really helpful, but that you have to do a lot of convincing to be able to get those funded. Elevating leg rests um, can also help with um, contracture management, so it helps to be able to stretch out your hamstrings. If you do have a power recline option, you have to have um, the ability to have this, otherwise it's a real stress on your low back. Stand-up options are another um, really nice option that is really hard to get funded, but I love them. It allows you to be able, you can stand up to drive or you can stand up throughout the day and provide some weight bearing through your bones, which we all know is important. Um, I try to get my guys that have them to be able to stand up at least five or 10 minutes in each classroom period so that they um, end up standing for about an hour a day. Um, these really take a lot of work to get approved, but if you have the ability to get it funded, it's a great option. I recommend um, advocating for these early on to make sure that you um, get them before the contractures develop. And uh, th that, this is the micro mini joystick I was talking about earlier that just allows uh, our really weak boys to be able to drive. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna go to some really ultra high tech options. So the uh, Bluetooth, this is a really nice option that I've had so many guys use um, recently that really enhances their life. So through your joystick, it actually allows you to be able to operate your phone, operate your tablet, or operate your computer or a gaming system. So it's, it, you have to make sure that you ask for that. I have not had a lot of trouble getting it funded, but it's a, re, it's a really nice add-on option. Um, the next slide is of the wireless um, head, 
a, a head um, wireless headset that allows you just through head movements to be able to turn, go forward and backwards. You do have to have really nice um, stable head control to be able to do this. So I haven't actually seen anybody that's had this. I just saw some videos and it looks really exciting. The eye gaze system is um, a, also a nice option for really weak patients. Um, the caveat on this is that you, you look, you use your eyes to look at a screen and it tells you where to go. You'd need to be really good at this to be able to look at the screen, make the decisions of where you want to go at the same time, look at your environment so you don't run into anything really an important option. Um, there's also a, a multitude of other options. Um, fiber optics, I've had a, um, one or two patients use fiber optics, head array, which is switches just on the side, um, things like a sip and puff wheelchair, or there's even a game controller. Tim showed the uh, video game controller before, but you can actually get one, excuse me, that you use to power a chair. However, those are hard to get um, approved because uh, the insurance company thinks they're just for playing games. Next slide, please. So we talked about the power chairs, which I think is the most important. We want to move on now to other options. And um, prone standers are um, pro different standers. All we, this is another way to get you up and standing. So there's prone standers, supine standers, and sit to stand standards. Um, both the prone and supine standers have a few drawbacks um, because there, it takes a lot more caregiver assistance to put them put someone onto one, you have to lift them and put them on into a totally flat position. If you have fixed contractures so you can't straighten your knees or hips, it's not always comfortable and it's not always great for your feet if you, um, if you can't actually get into that position. The sit to stand standard, this um, lower one, you can see that it's a um, seating system that actually goes up to a standing position, but you can stop it anywhere in between that allows you to be able to um, stand with knee and hip, and hip flexion contractures. Next slide, please. So bathroom equipment, this is hugely important and we need to start looking at this early. Um, there's some low tech options and there's higher tech options, but um, the raised toilet seat is, is something that's easy to get. It's kind of a, a short term fix uh, while the boys can just still stand and transfer. But I, wa I wanted to show the, this handheld urinal only because I have kids that have stopped walking that have never considered this as an option. Everyone that um, goes to school and has to be transferred every single time they have to pee into a um, um, uh, toilet seat or shower chair, it's really a hassle for them and it takes a lot of caregiver assistance and it's, and it's not the best option. If you have a handheld urinal, if you can recline all the way in your seat, you can use that and it, it, you don't have to be transferred out of your chair as much. A tub transfer bench is just a shower chair that you put in the tub. It has a lip that hangs over the edge that allows you to be able to sit on the edge and slide over. Nice option for kids that are still walking. Um, sh a shower chair or rolling commode <coughs> is like a, it's like a potty chair on wheels. So it slides over the toilet, allows you to use it um, over the toilet with a more supportive seat. And then if you have the, um, the luxury of having a roll in shower, you can roll that right into the shower and take your shower in this. This is a really nice one that has the tilt feature, it has head, a head support, um, and it has um, foot rests. If you, if you do have a tub, there's, a tra there's some various different um, tub transfer systems that you can use that are, it's like a combination of a PVC pipe um, rolling commode that then hooks into this PVC pipe mechanism that goes over and into the tub. So you can just slide that in, which is a really, uh, another really nice um, option if you have room for it in your bathroom. Another issue that comes up a lot. A tub lift is a great option. I consider it a luxury. The issue with this is that if you get funding for a tub lift, you might not be able to get any other type of lift. Next slide, please. So that merges right into lifts and lift systems. These are really important. I, I know it's a hassle to use a lift system, but as caregivers, you need to know that your kids are gonna need you for a long time. And the lifts are, it's a cumulative strain on your back. So it's really nice to be able to have um, any of these different lift systems. A hydraulic or a left or electric lift, this is the most common. This is what many people just kind of call standardly as a Hoyer lift, but there's other ones available. It is, these are nice to have, um, and the disadvantage is they can't be used in the bathroom, they can't be used in the car. Uh, the, the, the legs just go underneath the bed and lift you, and then you can turn it and put in the chair. 
A sit to stand stander, um, you, you need to be able to sit independently or, or have somebody stand with you as you get hooked into this. And then you lean forward into the lift system and you can be moved from one position to another. Um, another sit to stand option is that you can use one that it actually can go into like a walker. This doesn't work as well for our Duchenne boys. It works much better for um, like children with cerebral palsy. And here is the champagne of lift systems. This is an overhead lift that is really nice that you can, it, it just glides along the ceiling and then you can be transferred into the tub. You can use it um, from, your, from the um, bed into your chair. It doesn't usually go through doorways, so you might need to get more than one. It's very expensive and it's a, another thing that's hard to get approved, but if you can do it, it's wonderful. Next slide, please. So other lifts, these are, these are also important, typically never um, funded by insurance, but there may be, you may have some other um, options for funding. A stair lift, and this, these are great if you have one flight of stairs, if you have to go around the corner or have multiple flights of stairs, or have a multi-level house, that can be a little bit more challenging. There's an elevator, pretty self-explanatory. And then vans with lifts, there's lots of mechanical lifts that are options. You can also just use a, a ramp so you can have a um, van lift that's a, a, a automatic, or you can have like a, um, a trunk hitch on the back of like an SUV. Next slide, please. And these are other fun things. This is just some quick options that I, things that I learn from other families all the time that are fun. That this picture is a picture, this is called the track chair. These are expensive, not funded by insurance. Uh, we're lucky enough in Colorado to have a um, national park that actually has these available to go on trails, but they're like an all-terrain vehicle wheelchair. Um, they're pretty awesome, and they're, their kids have a lot of fun um, driving them. I've had a couple of fam one little boy that just got his as a make-a-wish. This is just a really low-tech thing that I had. I, I learned so much from my families, and I, this is something that I learned from one of the families that comes to our clinic. This is, it's like a seated um, wheelchair, I mean, um, computer desk. You just sit on it. I loved it because I thought you could sit there, you could have your computer, you could have your game controller, you could, you could lean against the wall, you could have your legs straight out in front of you, and that would mean you could stretch your hamstrings, something that physical therapists are always looking for. This is just a, a pillow-like lap tray, really low-tech, very inexpensive. You, could, you can use in your bed if you wanted to be able to utilize a game controller. You can put it in your chair to be able to help you eat. Again, it's a, it's a low-tech, inexpensive thing. Tim talked about these. These are the readily available things that are available for everybody. This is um, a doorbell camera. I just use this as an example. Um, Tim had some really nice slides of other things that you can use that are just available on the re regular market. We're so lucky right now that all these things are so readily available. Next slide, please. And coming soon, uh, Tim showed a picture of a couple of things that are robotics now, but they're becoming more affordable, more reliable, and more available. And I think that will just only get better in the future. So that's what we have to look forward to. I um, heard just from a family yesterday in clinic, this just happened yesterday, so I couldn't show a slide, but um, one of my families told me about a new um, power wheelchair that's folding. It also has a, a backup camera. It has a remote control that you can actually, if you were in bed, you could have the chair come to you. It has an autonomous drive option, so you can actually drive it hands-free. So if you were carrying like a load of laundry, you could use it. Not available in the United States, not FDA approved yet, but hopefully one day something like that will be really nice uh, for all of us to be able to have. So with that, Next slide, please. This is just my thank you. And I really appreciate the opportunity the MDA gave us to be able to present. I appreciate all of you and all the families that I've learned so much from over the years. So we can now open it up for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Tim and Terry. I love the minions. <laughs> um, <laughs> we do have some questions that came in um, regarding a wrist support. Uh, this little boy loves leaving his wrist support on all day. He says it's so comfy. But the minute the splint comes off, the wrist folds up and he won't use his hands. Will leaving it on for the majority of 24 hours do more harm than good? So it, it's hard to answer just that little bit of information. So the first thing I would ask is, is it just a wrist support that only supports the wrist and the fingers are free to open and close? Or is it something that the whole hand is, I'm assuming the fingers are free to move and close. 
he doesn't say just that his wrist folds up and he won't use his hands. It's his left side, which is the weakest of sides. And did, she, did she say how old he was or what type of movement? No. Okay. Well, if she's listening, I'll ask that she please types in a little bit more information. So, so generally during the day, if we have kids that have a little bit of a wrist drop where the wrist falls down and collapses down, so it's okay. a reflex position, which is what I think she said, okay. um, we, we will sometimes make a, a splint or they can order ones that are custom made that support the wrist and keep the wrist even and allow the fingers to open and close still. And, and, that's, and that's okay. And that'll keep the hand in a good position to function. Um, but ideally, you should probably still get it off at some point during the day for some active, some active movement. Uh, if, if they don't have the ability to extend to lift that wrist up at all, mm -hmm. then it's not really, there's not a downside to wearing it during, during the day. Why the child wouldn't use the hand when the splint comes off, that, it, it's hard to know. She said 18 years, fingers are non-movable in support. Okay. Um, the two videos of the arm assist that you showed, yeah. um, what was the name of that device? So the video, it's called the Rex, W-R-E-X, the Wilmington Robotic Exoskeleton. That's, I show that one because that's the one I'm most familiar with. I've worked with the engineer uh, who designed it from the University of Delaware, and it's more affordable than some of the other high-tech options. It's still a challenge to get funded at times, um, but it is easier to get funded than some of the some of the motorized options. What is the what would be the cost of something like that? And then does insurance sometimes help pay for that? So uh, I, I don't know the exact cost. We've um, ballpark. You know, there there are a few thousand. There are a few thousand dollars. Okay. Three to four thousand dollars. Uh, insurance insurance does like I said some insurances will pay for it okay the the one challenge is they named it a robotic exoskeleton so in for, even though there's no really robotic component some of the insurance companies deny it saying that um, you know robotic devices aren't aren't covered under the policy and it's experimental where it, it's not really the case so it, it can be a challenge but we've had Success. We have a great social worker in our clinic who's worked with some local charitable organizations who mm -hmm. donate money to cover the cost of them. So if, if they're interested, they can start with talking to the therapist and go through the insurance approval process. And then uh, their, their social worker and clinic could also be a good, um, a good resource for them for funding. And I'm happy. My, my email address was on the first slide. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to take emails from anybody to discuss this further or arrange a phone call if, if that works better. Okay. Are there any recommendations regarding voice control or eye control to type and control your computer? So honestly, it's very individualized. I have kids who have extremely little mobility and to me, it appears to be cumbersome for them to use the on-screen keyboard and the touchpad, but that's what they like. And I feel like they'd be more effective with, with voice control or eye control. Okay. Most, you know, the I saw in the chat some people were saying like they've tried uh, voice control stuff before and it didn't work so well. Some listen better than others. I mean, these are things that with every update to your phone and every update to the with technology, they get better and better and better. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the challenge with, from a user's perspective, the challenge sometimes with, with doing things verbally or voice control, especially for like speech to text, is it's a little bit of a process of getting used to that that train of thought instead of like kind of thinking in your head and typing out loud you know you're speaking it out loud so i think it's there definitely is um you know you need to allow some time to acclimate to that type of system but i think it's just it's much more easily accessible than relying on the hands uh there are some devices that uh you know the regular iphone you can do head controls with a regular iphone under accessibility options where you can move your head and use your head kind of as a cursor on the screen I'm sure that the Samsung and the other, uh, I forget the term, I'm not tech savvy, the other non-iPhones, the Androids. Android. A Androids probably have a similar, similar function as well. Um, is there anything that is being done for the eye gaze with um, complications from the sun? So this person has typed in the, 
um, when they go outside? Um, is there a visor or something like that that might help? That's a great question. I've never been asked that before. Um, I know that there's some chairs that actually have like a little um, canopy that goes over the chair that might okay. help you, or you could maybe screen the, the um, computer so you could do that. I, uh, these are not very commonly used, so I'm not really sure, but that's, um, it's a great question. Okay. Can a Bluetooth joystick be swapped out for a standard joystick if we already have a functioning power chair? Or is this a feature we need to ask for when he gets a new chair? Uh, if you need to ask, some, you might be able to retrofit your old power chair. A lot of the new power chairs have it automatically, but so you need to add, they need to ask their vendor whether or not that's something that they could do and how much, if you have to swap it out, it might not be something that's covered that way. But um, typically the newer chairs, it's a much easier add-on. Okay. Um, any device to help kids who have just finger moves, finger movings, um, but no arm strength? If, for example, how to use a tablet now that everything is digital with schooling? So um, you there you can click. Like I know on the, on the iPad and the Apple devices, you can like double click on the bottom of the screen and it'll pull the top of the screen down so you don't have to use your finger as far to, to access those things. You can also set up on phones and on computers, other, other under accessibility options, other switches and, um, and, and functions that you can use again to kind of use like to click through as like a scanning software where it would highlight the links on the, uh, the icons on the phone or on the screen and, and once you're in it. Uh, a lot of my patients use the on-screen keyboard or use the voice to, te the voice to text, like the Dragon, Dick, Dragon Naturally Speaking and these programs that have, again, evolved over time and now are intuitive where they learn your speech pattern and, and kind of auto-correct and improve their, their effectiveness over time. Uh, the, the thing that's nice with the touchscreen stuff is it, it, it doesn't require a lot of force. Um, and then the simplest thing is if you go on your, your computer and you change the mouse settings, you can really dial down the amount of movement that's required from the mouse while still okay. scanning the whole screen. And then you can adjust the speed as well. But I mean, that's the quickest and easiest thing to do with the mouse is just adjust the settings on the, on the computer. Okay, and then real quick, we'll just um, finish our two questions if you guys have time. Um, what types of equipment for school are available to buy to assist with my son. I live in Puerto Rico and it's very difficult to obtain or provide, um, up to obtain or get anything provided by the Department of Education. Is, is there any resources you might recommend well, for her? That's, it's really hard. I mean, even state to state, it varies for how much the school, the school here, the schools here should automatically provide that. I have no idea about Puerto Rico. I think they would have to uh, they might want to talk to their state, their country's disability advocate team to be able to have that. Here we have a law that says you have to have everything that you need to be able to be um, as fully accessible as you can, but I have no idea if they have something similar in Puerto Rico. Um, okay. But that I, I, I think that it's certainly worth pursuing. All right. And then can you on that? I, I noticed that the MDA actually has an office and a direct uh, link and a direct contact in Puerto Rico. Maybe okay. you know, the person can just uh, reach out to them and maybe they will be able to support that better. But yeah, that would, yeah, if you could go to MDA.org and you could check our advocacy section, you um, would like to reach out and um, find some help or also you could contact our resource center for some further information on that with Puerto Rico. So feel free to do that. And lastly, Terry, if you don't mind, could you recommend a brand or model of shower chair rolling commode? Um, I, I really can't endorse anything. I can tell you what the picture was. Um, that's called a shower buddy, but I, okay. there's lots available. I think you have to find out what, um, what, you know, what's available through your insurance, mm -hmm. but um, the shower buddy, both the, um, the chair, the, rolling commode chair and the over the tub um, PVC type system. Those are both shower buddy um, chairs, but okay. uh, you know, I think it depends on, on, it's really nice to have, usually this is OT. So if you have a Tim and you're yeah. kind of having them actually come 
into your home and do an assessment and see how much room you have and what's available. And then that can dictate what kind you use. And someone just typed in that they have a Riften sh um, shower uh, tub chair that they love, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you both for your time. And uh, I know it's a weekend, so I appreciate your time and thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome, thank you. And this concludes our DMD symposium for today. I wanna to thank all of our presenters for their time and effort they spent on putting together their presentations. I would also like uh, to thank again our symposium supporters, Fibrogen, PTC Therapeutics, and Sarepta Therapeutics. And thank you to you guys for taking time to join us today. I know we put a lot of information out there, so I hope you guys found it helpful. If you do have questions after this, feel free to email at mdaengage at mdausa.org. And finally, I just want to remind everybody, I'm going to be sending out a brief survey. If you don't mind filling that out, so that way we can um, make improvements for any future education um, that we're doing around DMD. And uh, that's it. So thank you very much. And we look forward to having you join us later. Have a great rest of your day.